twelve, the hanged man. Mem, transliterated as the letter M, value forty, value as a final letter in a word as six hundred. This is the second of the three mother letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Its name means literally sees, but like many plurals in Hebrew, it designates a general idea. In this instance, water. In this connection, we may note that alchemists call water, quote, the mother, seed, and root of all minerals, end quote. In ancient books, neither direction nor planet is assigned to this letter. In the cube of space, however, it corresponds to the inner axis of the cube, connecting the center of the eastern face with the center of the western face. Moreover, the final form of the letter Mem shares with the letter Tav the attribution to the innermost center of the cube of space. And to this attribution, part of the symbolism of key 12 refers. In modern astrology, however, Neptune corresponds to Mem. The color assigned to this planet is pale blue, and the corresponding musical tone is G sharp, or A flat. Water, the element represented by Mem, is the first mirror. Water reflects images upside down, and this idea is carried out by the symbolism and title of Key 12, which is a symbol of reflected life, of life in image, of life in the forms taken by the occult water or cosmic substance. Water reflects images upside down, and this idea is carried out by the symbolism and title of Key 12, which is a symbol of reflected life, of life in image, of life in the forms taken by the occult water or cosmic substance. Hanged man, the title, means occultly suspended mind, because man and mind are from the same Sanskrit root, and this fact was known to the occultists who invented tarot. The title refers also to the utter dependence of human personality upon the cosmic life. In the rider pack, the youth hangs from a T-cross, but it is a cross of living wood to symbolize the cosmic life. It also represents the letter Tav. And in the B.O.T.A. tarot, the gallows from which the hanged man is suspended is shaped like a Hebrew Tav, as it is in all versions of this key except the rider pack. And in the B.O.T.A. tarot, the gallows from which the hanged man is suspended is shaped like a Hebrew Tav, as it is in all versions of this key, except the Rider Pack. In 1918, I received from an occult correspondent the following explanation of the hanged man. Quote, the correct geometrical figure concealed by the hanged man is a cross surmounting a water triangle. It signifies the multiplication of the tetrad by the triad. This is the number 12. The door, Daleth, is the vehicle of the tetrad, for it is the great womb also, and the head of the hanged man reflected therein is the lux in manifestation as the logos. He is Osiris, sacrifice, and yod he shin vav he, Yeshua. End quote. This is explanation enough for an advanced occultist, but requires some elaboration for the purposes of this book. It is evident that the legs of the hanged man form a cross, and that lines drawn from his elbows to the point formed by his hair will form the sides of a reversed triangle, having his arms for its base. The cross is the number four, and the triangle is the number three. The multiplication of these two numbers results in twelve, which, because it is the number of signs in the zodiac, represents a complete cycle of manifestation. The inverted triangle is one of the ancient ways of writing the letter Daleth. 
which corresponds to the empress, numbered three in tarot. She is what Hindus call Prakriti, the great womb of cosmic substance, the generatrix of all forms. By a similar numerical correspondence, the crossed legs of the hanged man may be taken to represent the emperor, since they indicate the number four. Thus they are red, the color of action, and also the color of fire, the particular quality of the sign Aries typified by the emperor. The upper garment of the hanged man is blue, color of water, and of the robe of the high priestess, symbol of the universal mind stuff. It has two pockets shaped like crescents and colored silver. Ten silver buttons refer to the ten sephiroth by their number, and by their material suggest that manifested life is a reflection of the one life. The belt and the braid down the front of the hangman's jacket form a cross, and the edging of his collar is so drawn that if we could see it all, it would form a circle. Thus, this part of the hangman's dress forms an inverted Venus symbol. Quote, the head of the hanged man is lux in manifestation as the logos, end quote. Means that his head, by its white hair, suggests identity with the emperor and the hermit. He is the ancient of days, reflected into the incarnate life of personality. One of the old occult names for the one life is lux, which is Latin for light. And this word is also an occult reference to the Hebrew name Adonai, or Lord. For the numeral values of the letter L, V, X in Roman numerals are respectively 50, 5, and 10. Their sum is 65. The numeration of the Hebrew name Aleph, Daleth, Nun, Yod. Adonai, Lord. The one light is the word which is made flesh, and is then represented by the esoteric Hebrew spelling of the name Jesus, i.e. yod heh shin vav -He, Yeshua, because Jesus was named after the Hebrew hero Joshua. These, however, are meanings of the picture which will not be likely to seem as important as they really are until the student has made considerable advance along the occult path. Fortunately, there are other meanings, less withdrawn from ordinary ways of thinking, but by no means less important. To these we shall devote the rest of this chapter. Here is a man turned upside down, inverted, in a position contrary to that in which we find most people. Tradition says, by the way, that St. Peter was crucified in this position. And the tradition may have more than a hint for us when combined with the idea that Peter is the rock of foundation. For the basis of the occult approach to life, the foundation of the everyday practice of a person who lives the life of obedience to esoteric law, hence Jakob Burme said, you may remember, that the great secret is to, quote, walk in all things contrary to the world, end quote. The same idea is represented by the garments of the hanged man. His legs are red, color of fire, and his jacket is blue, color of water. These elements are as opposite as light and darkness, as contrary as black and white. Thus opposition is plainly symbolized by the clothes, as well as by the position of the figure. This does not mean outspoken antagonism to others. On the contrary, such a spirit is precisely the way of the world which occultists endeavor to avoid. Hence this picture is associated with the letter Mem, of which Kabbalists say, Quote, Mem is mute, like water. End quote. Silent, unostentatious reversal of one's way of life, combined with perfect tolerance of the ways of other people, is the method of the practical occultist. In what, then, does the reversal consist? Primarily in a reversal of thought in a point of view which is just the opposite to that accepted by most persons. At first, there may seem to be no practical advantage in this, but just consider. One need only look about him to see that most people are sick, that most people are in trouble, 
that most people cannot get along with themselves or the world. Does it not become evident, then, that most people are in trouble because they have somehow put the cart before the horse in their practice of life? In this scientific age, we know that everything is an expression of the working of the law of cause and effect. Is it not plain, therefore, that the miseries afflicting most people are the result of their negative use of the law? For every moment of a human life is some special application of the law, and the outcome depends wholly on whether the application be positive or negative. Practical psychology shows us the potency of ideas. It demonstrates conclusively the truth that thoughts are the seeds of speech and action, that interpretations are the patterns for experience, that what happens to us is what we have selected, whether the selection be conscious and intentional or unconscious and unpremeditated. Thus, in practical psychology, the emphasis is upon the importance of a changed viewpoint, and this change is no less than a total reversal. Every idea we considered in our study of Key 11 points to the central theme of the hanged man. This is that every human personality is completely dependent upon the all, here symbolized by the tree. As soon as this truth is realized, the only logical and sensible course of conduct is a complete self-surrender. This surrender begins in the mind. It is the submission of the personal consciousness to the direction of the universal mind. That submission is foreshadowed even in the picture of the magician, who derives all his power from above. Until we know that of ourselves we can do nothing, we shall never attain to adeptship. The greater the adept, the more complete his personal self-surrender. Paradoxically, this total submission of the personal life to life itself makes us intensely positive in relation to other persons and in relation to the conditions of our environment. Nobody who follows this course ever becomes a human doormat. Consciousness of the support of something transcending mere personal human power always results in positive mental attitudes. In the face of some of the appearances confronting us as we go through life, we need something more than just our personal energies to carry us through in order to have courage and persistence in spite of seeming disappointments and difficulties, we must know ourselves to be vehicles of a power to which nothing can be an insurmountable obstacle. The mental attitude suggested by the hanged man, then, is, quote, not my will, but thine, end quote. This is ever the position of the adept, as indeed it is the position of every person who works in any field of applied science. It is an attitude born of the knowledge that my will is an elusive personal thing, which is but the reflection or mask of thy will, the real will, which is the purpose or motive of the cosmic life, a will absolutely free and certain to be realized. This thought does not imply that the universal will visits affliction, disease, and poverty upon us. It does not mean that we must be resigned to our troubles, like dumb beasts making no complaint when they are beaten. It means that, in spite of appearances, the cosmic will works always toward good, that the universal will to good cannot possibly be defeated, it means that personality is known for what it is, a partial expression of the all, and that in consequence, our personal notions of what is best for us may often be mistaken. Our notions of the ways in which good is coming to us frequently fall short of being adequate anticipations of the blessings ahead. Thus, so long as we continue to make false interpretations, the inexorable laws of the cosmos work out those interpretations in pain-bringing forms. Yet pain itself is friendly because it is educative. Suffering, poverty, disease, inharmony, and death all have their lessons for us. These are the goads that prod the race onward in its search for truth. We do not fully understand why this is the method, but we can see 
that the very fact of manifested existence necessitates temporary limitations, with suffering as an inevitable consequence of such limitations. One does not need to be a philosopher to know that civilization is the result of human reaction against pain, the consequence of the human quest for ways to overcome limitation. Disease teaches us the laws of health. Frictions in human relationships goad us into the discovery of the secret of harmony, and the wise declare that in the mystery of death lies hidden the secret of immortality. Thoughts like these are the exact reverse of what most persons think. Practices in mind control and body direction, such as they are taught by psychologists and occultists, are laughed at by the world, and people who take them seriously are jeered at as men upside down. Yet the world's ridicule should be the best evidence that the occultists are right. For the world is sick unto death, writhing in pain, hag-ridden by war, pestilence, and famine. But the wise have found the way of health, of happiness, and peace.